charging drunks, cardiac kudos, exhausted Aussies, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at another special interview segment from EMS Today 2012 with our EMS 10 award winners. If that's what you're looking for, you'll find it right here on the MedicCast. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the MediCast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of The Medic Cast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, The Pod Medic, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the program this week. Got a lot of good stuff coming up for you with the new segments, and then we'll move on into another special interview segment from the EMS 10 Awards at EMS Today 2012. If you haven't already done so, make sure you check out all the information, links to all the in things we talk about in this episode, the news segments and the special tip and additional segments, all available for you over at the MedicCast website. You can get there for the video version at MedicCast.tv. You can also check out the regular blog site at MedicCast.com slash blog. And we'll have some more contact information for you at the end of the show. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can get those back to us. In the meantime, let's go ahead and move forward and we'll jump on into this week's news. Wouldn't you like to know there was a way to get those drunks that you constantly run into and end up having to transport to the hospital even though all that's wrong with them is they're drunk uh, just because the police don't want to deal with them? Wouldn't, you know, wouldn't it be nice to know there was a way to handle them with some kind of a nuisance fee? Well, guess what? Some places and agencies are already doing that. And in Franklin County, Virginia, they are instituting a new $350 charge for DUI drivers that require some kind of emergency response to their location. So police, fire, EMS comes to their location, they get dinged $350 fine right off the get-go at their DUI hearing. So uh, that's ex interesting to see, and I wonder how many other agencies are doing stuff like this. I also wonder if there's going to be other sorts of nuisance fees applied to uh, EMS. Maybe not a nuisance fee, let's not call it that, because you know how, how I feel about uh, how we deal with frequent flyers. So let's go ahead and call it uh, you know, a service fee. Uh, for those patients that maybe are always falling down and can't get up and they call 911 because they need somebody to help them get back up in their chair. They don't need to go to the hospital, they just need assistance. Um, you know, I believe this falls under a community paramedicine model. I, in fact, believe it falls under we're a paramedic, do the job, care for people. That's what our job is. Uh, but some agencies are overstrapped, uh, cost a lot of fuel to go out nowadays, even for a quick run across your district to help somebody get back in their, their chair uh, or provide some other basic assistance. So maybe we should start charging or applying some kind of a service fee to these types of community service calls. Uh, just kind of springs out of the idea of charging drunks additional fees. Why don't we charge other people that use the system uh, for things other than true emergencies? Charge them for a fee for using services that are not necessarily emergency services. So just something interesting to see and uh, I'll be interested to hear back from the rest of you if you are doing something like this in your area. Next up, a local agency was recognized by the CARES Registry and other cardiac uh, services around the country as their localities, Pennsylvania's uh, agency that provides ex exemplary cardiac care um, and looking at how they handle both acute coronary syndromes and managing cardiac arrest patients. Uh, this is exciting. It's uh, just up the road from us in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and I uh, am excited to hear about this. Uh, you may not know what the CARES Registry is. It, it's, a, it's a reporting service, uh, independent and free, that you can report cardiac arrest and, and cardiac data into to gather, gather information and data from nationwide on how 
cardiac care is handled in the emergency services setting. And then uh, that information can be gathered back and you can look at how you're improving and where you need to improve some more. And it's really meant to be a positive tool for improving patient care. Uh, if you want to find out more about it, you can check out the information over at Tom Boothelay's blog at the EMS 12 lead. Uh, blog. It's ems12lead.com. Uh, he also has a program, the EMS 12 Lead Podcast, and uh, we've talked about the carriage registry with uh, Tom on there many, many, many times. So uh, if you're interested and maybe wondering if your agency reports to the carriage registry, you should check it out. But I just wanted to give a, a hello and some kudos to the folks just up the road who have shown a vast improvement in handling cardiac care in cases. And, and uh, they point out uh, several reasons why and top of the list is just training. These people are maintaining their certifications they're, and they're going beyond that. They're training and practicing even when they don't have a patient. I don't know how many cardiac arrests you get in your jurisdictions. They aren't all that frequent and so you do need to practice managing the code. You do need to practice Who's going to do what on those locations? It's a complex situation and seconds count. And so when you do that, when you practice, when you train and get that pit crew approach to dealing with cardiac arrest handling, you will find that your survival rates start to increase almost immediately. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, some of the other things they're doing in this program include therapeutic hypothermia, uh, chilling the patient with cold, normal saline IVs. Um, they're also uh, doing uh, some other things to manage patients uh, differently. And basically following the updated guidelines from the uh, American Heart Association and the cardiac care um, organization. So those emergency cardiac care guidelines are there for a reason. And if you apply the, the recommendations and the standards of care that they, they get there as they find new things that work or don't work, you're going to be able to improve care for your patients. And maybe your agency will get recognized both uh, online by the CARES registry, but also recognized here on the MedicCast. So what do you do when you're just so exhausted you can barely keep your eyes open and you're trying to man manage a patient on the way to a hospital during a long transport? How do you handle that? How do you deal with it when you're just that exhausted? This is a problem, and it's not just a problem here in the States, it's a problem all over the place. And I found this article from Australia talking about this very issue. They have an anonymous paramedic, and they've given that person the name Susan, and that person talks about the fact that they're putting in over 80 hours a week, they're dead on their feet, and that this exhaustion is actually causing medical errors to occur. Uh, and, and really, I would argue, not at the fault of the paramedics doing it. When you get that tired, when you become that fatigued, and you, you end up making mistakes. It's, it's like you're operating under an impairment. You might as well just give them drugs and, and let, them get, get them, let them get sloshed and drunk and then go out and treat patients because that's what the effect is in the workplace when, when the workplace is set up such a way that they're working those kind of hours. Part of the problem is, is that there doesn't appear to be, based on this article, an efficient way to handle transitions between shifts. So if you're working a 10 hour shift and you're five minutes before your shift gets off and the next crew isn't in there in yet and you're out on the road, you get called to go to the next transport. And in some cases you might have two or three hours before you're back in station. So that means all of a sudden you went from a 10 hour shift to a 13 hour shift and maybe you get called again because you're not back in station. There needs to be an efficient way to handle it. Maybe chase vehicles that allow the crews to meet each other in the field, trade off and get them back to the station and, and home. Uh, there's gotta be a way to handle this. And uh, I hope that agencies are taking these things seriously. Uh, the other common problem, they don't talk about it here, but here in the States, uh, a lot of EMS agencies are working in fire department setups or using a fire department model for shift work where they're working 24 hour shifts. Now, if you're in a small agency that's not that busy, that may work for you. You can work a 24 hour shift and still get your sleep in. You might get a little tired now and then if you're really busy, but usually you, know, you may only run five or six calls a day. But what about those places where they're running 20 calls a day and working a 24 hour shift? The firefighters in the same building are getting plenty of sleep. They have time to eat good meals, uh, but the EMS crews are barely getting back into their unit and back in the station before they get called again. So uh, this is a problem and we need to address it. Uh, sometimes uh, one thing doesn't work for everybody in every situation and we have to adapt models that make it not only efficient to practice in our area for the management, but also 
safe to practice in areas for the paramedics and EMTs that are working there. So uh, take a look at these articles and, and uh, you can find those links and get back to me. Let me know what you think. Uh, have you run into a situation where you've been that tired and worried about patient safety because of your fatigue? I'd love to hear from you. And of course, we'll keep it all on the down low, but I think that we need to have open, honest discussion about this to find out ways we can make it better. So I'd love to hear from you, podmedic at mac.com or send me a message via Twitter or Facebook. Next up is an interview segment I did with David Rhinus at EMS Today 2012. He's one of the EMS 10 Innovator Award winners from last year. And David is in Colorado near Denver and is actually, has actually come up with an innovative way to educate and maintain standards for cardiac care with the paramedics using pig hearts. So check out this interview with David on how he found a unique way to revisit anatomy and physiology and help folks understand things like STEMIs, things like advanced uh, coronary, acute coronary syndromes, and of course cardiac arrest and why and how they occur. So check this interview out. Hi, this is Jamie Davis for Innovations in Patient Care, and we're here at EMS Today 2012 for the EMS 10 Awards again this year, and I'm really excited because of just the innovators, the unsung heroes, the people that have come up with a new way to either educate, to innovate, to provide better care for our patients. And uh, I'm here with David Rhinus, an educator from Centura Health in Denver, Colorado. And David, you've come up with an interesting program to find a new way to help EMS professionals visualize and understand what's going on with a STEMI patient, with a cardiac patient, and kind of draw conclusions with, between the, what's going on in the anatomy and physiology directly with what they're seeing on EKG. Can you tell us a little bit about how that program came about? Well, I've been a paramedic for 30 years, and what I tried to do is bring about a program that um, would speak to um, people who learn visually and to put a 3D model in their hand so that they could um, understand um, anatomy uh, on a real level. And so um, I was looking for a program and um, one of the um, um, providers to um, Centura Hospital was um, St. Jude's and they did a heart dissection. So I went to that um, and it was more geared towards the hospital and heart cast and things like that. But I thought what a great idea to take a 3D model and let's bring it to the paramedics and let's bring it to the paramedics on a level that they would under, understand um, and relate it to, to STEMI, and, but also bring, bring about what, what could go um, awry as far as mimics go, and um, use a, a model and dissection. So I surrounded myself with some really talented people from um, Lilton Hospital's cath lab, from St. Jude's um, um, Medical, they provide um, um, pacemakers and um, our own medical directors, Dr. Eby, and we um, found a good model, which is a pig heart, and brought it out to um, the paramedics and um, did a dissection and put it down to a field level for them. And what was their initial response? I mean, so much of what we learn, at least, at least when I went through paramedic, was that it was really book learning as far as your anatomy and physiology. There wasn't a lot of hands-on. It was look at this picture of a heart, uh, memorize this diagram of blood flow and things like that. But so many people are different types of learners. They really need that hands-on and that 3D perspective to be able to rotate that heart. And, and the pig heart's a perfect analog for the human heart. It is. It's so close to the human heart um, in so many ways and um, it, it initially when I brought it up wasn't accepted with full-blown enthusiasm um, as far as this is what it's going to cost to bring it out to the field and this is what we need to do and but my, my management um, got behind it, supported it, said let's give it a try and the first class just to go in there and see regardless of the tenure of the paramedic, see their eyes light up and, and um, have them take a look and they go, I, I never knew 
that the tricuspid valve was translucent. It makes so much sense now when I look at the right versus the left side of the heart, why the left side of the heart is the high pressure side because it's two or three times the thickness as the right side. So um, they, they could look at the structure and go, I can see why this would fail under hypertension situations. Mm -hmm. And you can see things like uh, words that are just words, you know, hypertrophy. Uh, what does that mean? Hypermegaly, all these words that mean different things. You can look at a heart and say, all right, I can get a sense of why this would be an uh, overexpanded section of the heart or that it's become, uh, the muscle tissue has become enlarged and, and this side of the heart is different because you've been able to actually handle it and see the differences in the two sides of this two pump system. And they also are able to, and that's where our, our um, heart cath um, lab came in, is um, one of the ladies, um, Jennifer Brooks, was extremely talented, and they um, were able to actually bring in the same stuff that they would utilize on a, on a um, human, and we would heart cast each one of the pig hearts, and the guys would get to do that, and they, they got an understanding of the the vessels and what side of the heart is fed, what side of the heart's dominant, and how important it is um, to open up these vessels and, and to call a STEMI as quickly as possible because time is tissue. What's the aftermath of this program? What have you seen or what have you heard back from your providers as they take this class and now they go out into the field and they apply the knowledge that they've gained? Well, we, we also have a very um, high-end QA program. One of last year's innovators, Ryan Mayfield, mm -hmm. um, does a lot of um, statistical analysis and he was able to show that this class has increased the um, calling of cardiac alerts in, in a positive way. You can call it, but one thing that you need to realize is that there, there are mimics out there that will mimic a cardiac alert in so many different ways. They can um, be because they're too cold from Osborne waves or they can have pericarditis from inflammation and drug use. So this also um, is able to help the paramedics recognize those mimics, which increases the percentage of the calls being called correctly um, and those mimics being thrown out. Right. And that's so important to uh, build confidence with the cath lab and the EMS services so that they trust you when you call in and say, I've got a STEMI alert, uh, especially if you're not transmitting data, because not all the systems are doing that. Uh, and, and so it's important for you to really become confident and, and knowledgeable in your skills and diagnosing uh, a positive STEMI of, uh, event. Oh, absolutely. Being able to call it correctly, call it quickly, all makes a tremendous difference in the outcome of the patient. When we first started um, cardiac alerts in its infancy, um, an hour, hour and a half was, you know, what, what we started with. Now we're down to 20 minutes amazing. of getting these patients in the cath lab, getting them sterilized and ready to have a catheter run up the femoral artery into their heart. From the time it being called, it's, it's an amazing time, time frame to, to look at and that all means what sort of outcome is that patient gonna have? If we are saving that much more tissue, then that patient will have that much more productive outcome in his, his life and be able to live a, a, a good productive life rather than being a cardiac cripple. Yeah, and it's, it's so important uh, to, to just keep in, innovating like this. So I just wanna thank you and congratulate you on your award uh, for the EMS 10 Innovation Award. It's, it's, it's exciting when I see people taking things that are commonplace. Uh, pig dissections are going on in colleges in places all over the country for different types of classes and programs and pulling that into a paramedic program and applying it directly to what we need to know about is just really exciting to hear about. So David, I wanna congratulate you. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts about the EMS 10 program? You know, this type of recognition of the innovators out there. What are, what are your thoughts when you think about the other people that were nominated with you and, and future nominees? Well, I'm, I'm very humbled, just, I, nobody gets, regardless of who you are, here on your own. Um, there should be five, six people behind me accepting this award. It was maybe my idea, my concept, but to bring this to fruition and having 
everybody um, be accountable for, for its success. Um, I, I think it's amazing, you know, I think that it's, it's nice that I'm receiving the award, but I think other people, it needs to be recognized, other people put a lot of work into this. I may be staying here getting the, the, the plaque per se, but a lot of people were, were there and put in a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, we've brought this to every department in, into our Denver metro area, and my hospital is um, a good hospital in respect to, it doesn't matter whether you're under our medical direction, we bring this out to anybody who wants the um, education. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you can imagine, there's a certain amount of cost involved in buying the, the, the pig hearts and a certain amount of um, time involved in the, the doctor's time who comes out and helps with the lecture and the people who do the um, cath lab and, you know, all the way down to um, St. Jude's Medical Center, you know, I mean, a lot of people are involved in this. Well, I'm glad that you had the great idea and, and that you were able to find the support you needed to implement it and, and uh, spearheaded that, that campaign. So thank you so much and congratulations again on your award. Thank you, sir. And I want to thank all of you for checking out this video and looking at our EMS 10 award winners from the 2011 year. I'm here at EMS Today 2012. And again, this is Innovations in Patient Care. You can find the audio version of this podcast in iTunes. Just look up Innovations in Patient Care. And you'll find this video in many places around the web, along with the other EMS 10 award winners from this year. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of the MedicCast. I want to thank all of you for checking out the show this week. Remember, you can find links to everything discussed in this episode, the news items, and links to information about the interview in this episode all over at MedicCast.com slash blog or on the video version, MedicCast.tv. And you can find all of that over on the MedicCast site and you can follow up on those links. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or other information you'd like to share, I always love getting news items from folks. Uh, sometimes I don't pick up on a news item when I go to do the show, so getting those sent to me is always a help. Uh, you can send those in to podmedic at mac.com. You can also always catch me over on Facebook and Twitter under the handle podmedic, and I'd love to become a fan, friend, or whatever over on those services as well. You can also become a fan of the MedicCast over at the MedicCast fan page, facebook.com slash MedicCast. And you can click the like button there and follow the MedicCast. Sometimes I put up shorter and different videos over there than you might find here. And uh, so it gives you an opportunity because you're, si you're liking the page over there to get some additional information and, and also start discussions with other fans of the show right there on the MedicCast fan page. So check that out. That's it for me. I'm going to be back soon with another episode. I do want to make sure you all know that we are going to be at EM, um, EMS World Expo coming up here in New Orleans at the end of October. So I think it begins on Halloween Day, October 31st. And you can find out more information. Go to emsworldexpo.com and follow up on that. We're going to have the live podcast studio there as well as a social media lounge with free Wi-Fi and a place to charge your devices. So you can come by, sit out in, in the social media lounge, listen to some live shows from the MedicCast, the EMS Garage, EMS Educast, and a bunch of other great shows. And relax a little bit while you're touring the exhibit hall floor. And again, thanks to EMS World Expo for having us back in to cover their event. It's a lot of fun, and we're already looking forward to it. So you want to find out more information, go to emsworldexpo.com. That's it for me. I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic. Be back soon. In the meantime, I want to remind all of you to remember scene safety, BSI.